Good morning, everyone. If you can all just concentrate. Yeah. If any one person can please lead us in prayer without my having to beg and plead, it's just basically us asking the Lord to help us in the class so that the class is meaningful and we learn something spiritual. Okay. So if someone could just open with a word of prayer, please. Father God, we are so grateful this morning for gathering us once again, a new week. And for the past teaching this week, we want to bless you. We pray that you will gather our hearts and minds to hear what you have. We pray for Pastor Deepika, Lord, that you will also use her to relay what you have put in her. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, so uh, last class we looked at first kings. We finished first and second Samuel, we moved into first kings. Um, today we will be getting into second kings. If you remember last time, we uh, very briefly touched upon the story of Jehoshaphat of Judah and the alliance that he made with Ahab of Israel. So the southern king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, a very godly man makes this very foolish decision of making a partnership with a very evil uh, Israelite king, Ahab. And then uh, we see that just because of the mercy of God, his life is spared. He's able to come out of the battle intact. But Ahab, uh, just as the Lord had prophesied earlier, Ahab dies in that particular battle. So this particular battle was supposed to be fought against the Arameans. No, Aram or Syria is basically the name which is used for that particular territory. And uh, so Aram was constantly again and again attacking um, Israel. Uh, the Arameans were quite powerful at this time. And uh, the Israel was rather weak. So constantly they would keep coming and attacking Aram whenever you know they, they felt like it. And then each time they come, uh, they would destroy the crops, take away whatever they wanted. In fact, even um, kidnap the people and take them away as slaves. So a lot of uh, you know um, damage was being done by these Arameans. They were in a very powerful position. Who was the commander of this very powerful Aramean army? It was a man named Naaman. Uh, so obviously he was the king's favorite because under him, the army had a lot of success. So many times they were able to come and attack Israel and take away, uh, you know, whatever they wanted, wealth and uh, slaves. Uh, and so uh, Naaman was in the good books of his king, the king of Aram, uh, because of all his military successes. But there was one, you know, drawback in Naaman's life. He had a skin disease. Now the word leprosy is used for almost all the skin diseases, you know, which were prevailing. Actual leprosy is highly contagious, or rather was contagious back then in those days. Uh, and so a person with that uh, kind of leprosy would not even be mingling with other people. They would be kept isolated. So whenever this word leprosy is used, you know, it's mainly talking about different skin diseases. It's not specifically talking about what we, you know, refer to scientifically as leprosy today. So Naaman, even though he had a skin condition, he could continue waging wars. He could continue leading the entire army successfully. So in his particular case, it was not a contagious skin disease. It was probably just something which made, you know, looked very bad and also probably troubled him a lot personally. So um, one of the slaves which he has taken back, you know, a girl that he has taken back as a slave from one of the cities, um, she tells her mistress, that is Naaman's wife. She says, if you were to go to the prophet who lives in Samaria, your husband would be made well. Um, so now if I were taken away as a slave uh, from my home uh, to serve in a foreigner's place, I would feel no sympathy. In fact, I would be happy that the man has a skin condition. But I'm assuming that maybe Naaman uh, was a very good man. Maybe he was a very decent person. And so this girl feels no uh, hatred towards the man who has captured her and brought her as a slave. And so, in fact, out of kindness, she, she suggests that he should go to the prophet uh, in Samaria so that 
he can be healed. And in fact, the prophet that they are referring to is um, Elisha. Uh, and so uh, Naaman consults with his king. And the king says, definitely go, you know. And in fact, I will formally send an official letter to the king of Israel along with you so that the king will take it seriously and he will see to it that you are healed. And so Naaman turns up over here uh, to uh, Samaria along with the official letter to the king. And uh, the king is very, very scared and upset. Uh, maybe we could read out 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. 2 Kings chapter 5, uh, if someone could read out verses 6 and 7, please. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Amman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his purpose. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Yeah, my God, to kill and make a lie that this man sends a man to me to heal me of his leprosy. Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. Now the king of Israel is first of all upset that on a regular basis Aram comes and attacks their cities and you know, takes away their wealth. So now this is this official letter which has been sent and he's very upset. He says, why is this king sending me this man? Am I God? Can I heal? What on earth can I do? So he's so distressed. He thinks ah, these people are specifically trying to pick a quarrel with me so that they can you know, lay siege on Samaria and take over the entire capital. That's the reason why they're sending this letter. And he is highly distressed. Elisha says, no problem. Just send the man over to my place. So, uh, you know, Naaman is, uh, arrives at, um, at uh, Elisha's door. And because he is a very powerful commander in chief of a very successful army, he assumes that Elisha will come out and talk to him and treat him with respect and call out to, the, to Yahweh and, you know, lay his hand upon him and heal him. Elisha does not even bother doing any of that. Uh, Elisha just sends a messenger and says, go to the river and, you know, um, clean yourself, uh, you know, um, seven times, seven times you need to, uh, you know, uh, place yourself in the water, immerse yourself in the water. Naaman is highly offended. He's a great man. He's not exactly an ordinary person. He's won battles for Aram again and again. He's a man of that caliber. So he says, this prophet didn't even bother to come and show his face to me. So he says, you know, um, this is what he says in um, verse 12, I think. Yeah. So if someone could read out for us 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 12. He was enraged. He says, this man is asking me to go and immerse myself over here in this, uh, uh, you know, river. Uh, I, may, I may as well have done it back in my own hometown, if you know that, if that could help. Uh, because um, the Arameans considered themselves way superior to the Israelites. Israelites are the people whom they come and attack whenever they feel like it. So, you know, he, he, he feels, you know, why on earth should I want to immerse myself in this dirty Jordan River? I have better rivers back home in Damascus. You know, that is the attitude with which this man comes. And then his servants plead with him and they say, you know, if, if he had asked you to do something more complex, would you have not agreed and done it? He's just asking you to go and immerse yourself seven times. Please do it. So maybe he was a good man. Even his servants are showing concern for him. Uh, so he goes over there, immerses himself seven times, probably grumbled the entire seven times. But then he comes out and it says that his skin was like that of a young boy, completely clean, completely whole. And this is an amazing thing for him because he probably has lived with a skin condition his entire life. And in a moment, you know, he's, it's now gone. And these are the words which he speaks. An amazing thing that he, you know, a testimony which he gives out of his own mouth. Uh, so if we could have someone read out 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 15. 
and he returned to the man of God. He and all his company and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is God, that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Naaman probably had a heart to know the truth. Here was a man who was willing to receive the truth. And so God does this for him and reveals himself to him. And this man acknowledges and says, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. And uh, so, uh, you know, now, now this time when he comes, he stands in front of Elisha, which means Elisha is willing to speak to him face to face now. And uh, Elisha, you know, says, I don't want any gift or reward from you. I don't need any gift. Arabians, you know, the Lord can quite care, is quite capable of taking care of my needs. Uh, so he does not accept any uh, gift. Naaman, on the other hand, asks a gift from him. Uh, this is what Naaman says in verse 17. Uh, so, yes, if someone could read out that. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two more burden of earth? For thy servant we henceforth offer neither bond offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. So Naaman says, I would like, you know, um, uh, three to four large gunny sacks of, uh, I don't think they used gunny sacks, whatever it is that they used in those days, you know, to carry the uh, earth, uh, the mud from Israel. What's the intention? Why does he want to carry back mud from Israel? The idea is that he is saying, I'm going to build an altar with this, a mud altar with this in my own land. And this is Israelite earth signifying that I'm worshipping the God of Israel. And over there, I will begin to uh, offer sacrifices only to this living God. So using an altar made out of the mud of um, Israel, I will offer sacrifices only to Yahweh. In other words, he's saying now onwards, I am going to be the worshipper of one and only God, Yahweh, and no other God. And then he says to you know, uh, Elisha, this one uh, you know, uh, occasion where you may mistake my loyalties because you know my king is an old man and then I would have to accompany him to the temple of Rimmon uh, because his king is a worshipper of Rimmon. So he says, when I go over there, and uh, the king is, you know, bowing down before the idol because I am the one holding him and supporting him. I too will have to bend and bow down. But please know the fact that I am not a worshipper of Rimon or any other idol. I am going to be a worshipper of Yahweh alone. Now, why did we devote so many minutes to this particular story? Because Jesus acknowledges this person in, uh, you know, uh, Luke. So if someone could actually turn to Luke chapter 4, and if we could look at verses 25 to 27, Luke chapter 4, verses 25 to 27. And the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sido, to a woman who was a widow, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet, and none of them was healed. Except this is verse in Second Chronicles, which talks about how the eyes of the Lord are always roaming the earth, searching, looking for any person who will be willing to place their trust in him. It's so sad. The Lord looked throughout the land of Israel and could not find one person who, you know, who would be willing to reach out to him and become loyal to him and him alone. So the Lord, in fact, had to go to outsiders to Gentiles, to find someone on whose behalf he can show himself strong. I mean, isn't that such a tragedy? So Jesus points out that, you know, in the book of Luke, in the gospel of Luke, and he says, you know, uh, 
the people the gentiles the outsiders show more faith in the living god than you people who are supposed to be part of the covenant uh, so it's a very sorry state of affairs uh, that we see in the northern kingdom of israel where the story takes place there were so many other people with skin diseases in israel at that time but none of them received healing because none of them bothered to go to the prophet of the living god and place their faith in the living god only an outsider was willing to come and you know uh, receive this healing this miracle um so we see that the entire northern israel was in a very very terrible condition especially because of ahab and his wife jezebel who brought in a lot of idolatry and they turned people completely away from the living god so we see this very horrible state of affairs in the northern kingdom at which point god decides to bring judgment upon the entire uh, household of ahab uh, ahab of course anyway has died you know he dies in that uh, battle with the uh, arameans however uh, you know his successors his wife they are still alive and so in second kings chapter 9 uh, verses 6 to 7 the lord sends a prophet to jehu and this is what the lord says to jehu in second kings chapter 9 um if maybe you could read out verses 6 and 7 second kings chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 and he arose and went into the house and he poured oil or he poured the oil on his head and said unto unto him thou said the lord god of israel i have anointed thee the king king over the people of israel even over israel and thou shalt smite the house of ahab thy master that i may avenge the blood of my servant the prophet and the blood of all the servant of the law at the hand of jezebel yeah so um ahab and her and his wife jezebel have cold bloodedly murdered many of the prophets many of the people of god because these people would have you know protested against the practices which ahab is bringing in they would have said please stop this idolatrous practices and turn back to yahweh and so in the process ahab and his wife have murdered many of the people of god so the lord says i am now going to avenge the blood of my servants and i have appointed you jehu to do this so the lord says for four generations you will be allowed to stay on the throne in as a reward if you will go and destroy the entire house of ahab and uh, so in second kings chapter 9 verses 21 onwards we see a uh, jehu coming to accomplish this uh, who is on the throne at that time uh, ahab's son ahaziah he dies uh, he dies badly because you know he has no uh, faith in the in yahweh in fact he mocks the help which yahweh is offering so ahaziah dies badly uh, but ahab has got one more son joram so right now joram is the one who is sitting on the throne and because of the marriage alliance which has taken place between these two families you know the uh, jehoshaphat's family and ahab's family uh, jehoshaphat's son ahaziah he has come to visit joram because you know joram is uh, um, wounded in battle and not doing well so both ahaziah jehoshaphat's son and joram the son of ahab are both together at the palace and jehu comes along and uh, so they go out to meet him and joram asks and says have you come in peace jehu and then jehu says how can there be any peace as long as there's all this idolatry and witchcraft of your mother and then joram realizes that this man has come to murder them so joram is killed ahaziah is also killed um uh, so which means the king of judah is dead the king of israel is also dead jehu kills both of them he then goes to jezebel's home he kills her as well and so he uh, brings judgment upon these people uh, for the you know sins which they and their family have committed so now the throne is vacant in the kingdom of israel the throne is vacant in the kingdom of judah uh so then you have the next king taking over in uh, in israel but in juda when the throne becomes vacant who is the mother of this dead person ahaziah 
uh, his parents are basically Jehoram and Atalaya. So Atalaya thinks this is a great opportunity for me to get onto the throne. So if I can kill and murder all of my grandchildren, nobody will be left to climb onto the throne and then I can take the throne for myself. And so her own grandchildren, she has them all massacred. A mass murderer is what she is. And, and in that manner, she you know, takes over the throne in Judah. So Atalaya takes over the throne in Judah. And then we are told about how one particular uh, you know, child, one um, descendant of Ahaziah is miraculously saved from the massacre. So that would be in 2 Kings chapter 11. Um, if we could maybe read out verses 1 to 4. 2 Kings chapter 11 verses 1 to 4, please. So when her son was there, she arose and destroyed all the royal heads. But Jehoshiva, the daughter of King Jorah, sister of Isaiah, took the jewels, the son of Abaziah, and stole him away from among of among the king's sons who were being murdered, and they they hid him and his nurse in the bedroom from Athaliah, so that he was not free. So he, he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord for six years, while Athaliah resigned with the reign over the land. In the seventh year... Yeah, yeah that, that should be adequate, I think, for our purposes. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, we see that... Um, um, that, uh, that Jehoram and Atalaya have many children, of course. Uh, the um, crown prince was Ahaziah. He was the one who went to the throne. He also had a sister named Jehosheba. Jehosheba, her life changed because she married the high priest, a godly man named Jehoiada. So, you know, she becomes the wife of Jehoiada and she becomes a godly, God fearing person. And so, when she uh, you know, uh, sees Atalaya starting the murders, you know, she, she has given commandment for, for everyone to be wiped out and one by one all the uh, heirs to the throne are getting killed. She immediately rushes, is able to grab hold of one child, uh, you know, who's maybe probably about a few months old. She grabs hold of the, of the baby and she hides the child in a room in the temple of the Lord. Um, the priest and all the priests, the Levites would, you know, basically be living in quarters surrounding the temple of the Lord. So that's basically where she hides the child. So Joash, you know, is the one descendant of Ahaziah whose life is spared. And so he grows up over there in the temple of the Lord for um, six years. And when he's seven years old, he's officially placed on the throne. Ataliah is killed, you know, for her um, uh, treachery. And uh, so Joash becomes king. But the really sad thing is that Joash never really had his own personal relationship with Yahweh. As long as Jehoiada is there to guide him, influence him, he walks in the ways of God. But once Jehoiada dies, he starts going away from Yahweh. So it's easy for us to you know, be very, very spiritual when we are living in a spiritual environment. Especially if you guys, you know, students who are here in the Bible college. Quite easy to live a spiritual, godly life when you're in such a spiritual environment. But tomorrow, what, uh, what will happen when you go back to your own towns, when you're to your own cities? And there's nobody, you know, constantly instructing you and telling you, get up now, pray at this time, have your Bible reading at this time, you know, spend time in prayer. If, what if this? What if a time comes when this, when, when someone is not constantly supervising you and monitoring you and telling you to walk in the ways of God? By that time, would you have delivered a, uh, you know, uh, op obtained a passion in your heart for the Lord, where you have your own relationship with Him, where you have caught a fire, and that fire will keep you going. It will not matter whether you're sent to North Korea or whether you're sent to China. That fire, which is which you have cultivated during this time. It will keep you going. But if you have not developed your own personal close relationship with the Lord, once you've been, once you're taken out of this spiritual environment, 
you may go back to your old ways so that is what happened to this man uh, joe ash you know whose life was spared in such a miraculous manner he never cultivated his own relationship with yahweh which is a big mistake so once jehoiada died and nobody was there to you know counsel him supervise him like a father figure controlling him now he was free to do whatever he wanted and his true colors began to come out and um, uh, when uh, jehoiada son zechariah sees what is being done in the kingdom you know he says this is evil you should not be indulging in idol worship please you know stop these things which you people are doing and then this man joash whose life was saved by jehoiada he literally has zechariah stoned to death imagine joash and zechariah would have grown up in the same house as kids they would have played together because jehoiada's dad jehoiada you know uh, the father he has uh, brought up joash along with his own son and now this man joash no gratitude whatsoever he literally has zechariah stoned to death and even as zechariah is dying you know he says um this is what he says um yeah that would be second chronicles chapter 24 uh, verse 22 yeah if someone could read out for us uh, second chronicles chapter 24 uh verse 22 this verse right it is no as you as the king did not remember the kindness which uh jehoiada his father had done to him but he and his son and as he died he said the lord look on it and repay it. Okay, so Zechariah dies uh, at the hands of Joash, whose life, you know, his father had actually saved. Um, so, um, so th- that is the condition that we see both in Israel and in Judah, where people have gone far away from the ways of God. Uh, if if you remember last class, I said that there were eight kings uh, who stayed loyal to Yahweh in the southern kingdom. In the northern kingdom, not even one person. was a follower true follower of yahweh in the southern kingdom eight kings stayed faithful but of those eight kings only two of them uh was so loyal to yahweh that yet yahweh praises them and we saw that one was hezekiah and the other was josiah only for only those two kings really express their full loyalty to yahweh uh, so let's look at um hezekiah um you know um his uh, um, hezekiah is basically you know the joash the murderer who has murdered zechariah he, he um, so hezekiah would be the great grandson of joash so the great grandson of joash is hezekiah um the grandson of josiah of jo- joash uh, was was ahaz ahaz was a very very evil person um so uh, in fact he closes the doors of the temple because he doesn't want anyone to worship the living god anymore so the grandson of jo- joash um is uh, a very evil person named ahaz but his son hezekiah is a good and godly person and so he reopens the temple and in fact he goes throughout the land and destroys all the you know um, high places to the pagan gods which have been constructed uh, and he tries to restore worship of the true living god uh, this is what you know the the bible says about hezekiah uh, he, uh, second kings chapter 18 verse 5 uh, maybe, maybe okay 5 to 8 yeah second kings 18 verses 5 to 8 this is the lord god of israel so the ark of him was not like the ark of all the kings of judah or who were before him for he held fast to the lord he did, he did not depart from following him but kept his commandments which the lord had commanded moses the lord was with him he prospered wherever he went and he rebelled against the 
king of Assyria and did not serve him. Yeah, so we see over here uh, that Hezekiah was so faithful to the Lord that it says there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. So high words of praise are given regarding this man Hezekiah, even though he grew up under a father who closed the doors of the temple so that nobody would worship Yahweh. I mean, he, he was the son of such an evil man, but he loved the Lord and he grew up right. Um, uh, and uh, so the Lord gives him the power which he needs to even rebel against the king of Assyria. The Assyrians have started getting very, very powerful now. The Assyrians were a dynasty, you know, based uh, around the region of Babylon. So the Assyrians were gaining more and more power. And now they are beginning to demand tribute from all the countries. They basically, their uh, you know, threat is this. If you don't pay pay us this much money, you know, in a, in a year, we will come and attack you and destroy your entire nation. So all the kings have started paying them tribute. But Hezekiah, because he's under the covering of the Lord, he rebels against the king of Assyria and says, I will no longer pay tribute because Yahweh will protect me and keep me. Uh, so he, in fact, he's in, able to rebel against the king of Assyria. So the Assyrians gain more and more power. And it's, uh, we get to know in 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 9 to 11, we are told that in the fourth year of Hezekiah's rule, you know, Hezekiah is, of course, the king of Judah. In the fourth year of his rule, in the northern kingdom, the Assyrians, they come, they lay siege to the capital city. And the capital city stays under siege for three entire years, which means the king, the uh, army, all the important officials and administrators, all the people who live in the capital city are trapped inside the city for three entire years until all the food supply runs out and there's nothing left to eat and they're left in that impoverished condition and then they finally surrender. And so Assyria is able to take over the entire northern kingdom and we are told over here in these verses that the king of Assyria deported Israel to Assyria. He takes away most of the population as, you know, uh, slaves and puts them in different places. Uh, the places where he resettles them are mentioned over here. Uh, so the northern kingdom falls during the um, fourth to sixth year of Hezekiah's rule. The northern kingdom falls. So Hezekiah and all the people living in the, in the land of Judah see with their own eyes how their brothers in the northern kingdom have been wiped out as a judgment which is brought upon them by Yahweh himself. So this should have in fact alerted them to you know become more godly. After seeing what God did to the northern kingdom, they should have become careful so that God will not bring similar judgment upon them. But then later on we get to see that they are an overconfident people. What they say to themselves is, oh, the Jerusalem temple is over here, right? So, yes, it's true that the northern kingdom got wiped out. But because we have the temple of Yahweh over here, Yahweh will never allow anything bad to happen to the southern kingdom. And so, you know, saying that to themselves, they continue in their idolatry. And then, of course, later punishment comes upon them as well. But not at this particular point. Because right now, you have a godly king, Hezekiah, ruling over the southern kingdom. But there are some consequences which we see as a result of this Assyrian rise in power. Um, so after their complete victory over the northern kingdom, they start attacking the southern kingdom where Hezekiah is you know, living. And this is what we read in 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 13 to 16. If someone could read out for us, 2 Kings 18, 13 to 16. The king of Hezekiah had been killed. Then, then, the king of Hezekiah attacked all the folk who fortified the king of Judah and captured them. The Hezekiah, king of Judah, said to Hezekiah, that Lachish, I have been wrong, withdrawn from me, 
so after their grand victory over the northern kingdom they begin to attack the southern kingdom and in fact they are able to attack all the fortified cities of juda and capture them so hezekiah you know had very boldly rebelled against the assyrian king saying i'll no longer pay tribute because the lord can take care of me but here uh, he suffers a series of defeats so at this point the right step probably would have been to go down you know to the temple of the lord get down on his knees and say lord why why are we failing why are the our fortified cities being taken over by the assyrians what can we do to change the situation how can you help us what do you want us to do so that you can come and give us victory he should have probably had a conversation with the lord but rather at this point this godly man chooses to have a conversation with the enemy instead he in fact sends a message to the king of assyria saying i have done wrong withdraw from me and i will pay whatever you demand of me so it's very sad actually he should have held his ground and continued you know in yahweh and spoken to yahweh and asked lord what can we do to get back our victory but instead he chooses to make a compromise he says to the king of assyria i'll pay whatever you want please you know leave me alone and so the king asks for a very very large amount which he doesn't have so he takes all the silver which is there in his royal treasury all the silver which is there in the temple of the lord and that's also not enough so then you know he has uh, gold plated the doors and door posts of the temple of the lord he strips off all of that gold and along with that gold he, you know and the silver he sends it across to the king of assyria to pay that huge tribute and his hope is that at least now the king of assyria will leave him alone but the story doesn't stop there so it actually doesn't really help to you know bargain with the with the enemy bargaining with satan will really not get you anywhere it would be better for you to go to the lord and say lord why is the evil one having a hold over my family what have we done what can we change how can you re-strengthen us so that we can gain victory even though we have suffered a series of defeats better to go to the lord and have a conversation with him so that you can I, the lord can tell you what you are lacking where you are missing out and can help you to gain your victory if you compromise and go to satan satan will never be satisfied he laughs he laughs for greater and greater compromises it never will work out so which is what we see over here he literally pays through his nose you know i mean he gives whatever he has to the king of assyria the king of assyria is not satisfied in fact probably that just, you know that just wets his appetite makes him want to take even more so he sends his field commander to the gates of uh, you know jerusalem and uh, so the commander comes over here and loudly in a voice which everyone can hear he starts speaking in the local language in the hebrew language so that everyone can understand what he is saying and this is what the field commander of sena sherib says um that would be second kings chapter 18 uh if we could maybe read out verses 28 to 30 yeah second kings 18 28 to 30 but then rab kasha said to them as my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall who will eat and drink their own waste with you then rabshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in hebrew and spoke saying hear the word of the great king the king of assyria okay that's so here's the word um 
verses if you could read out verses 29 and 30, please. Thus, thus is the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you from his hand, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us. Deliver us, this city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Yeah, that word Rabshake basically means it's a technical term, you know, like the Pharaoh, like the Caesar, all these are technical terms, uh, they're titles. So the word uh, Rabshake just basically is talking about the field commander's title. So the field commander says, your king is saying to you, trust in the Lord and the Lord will surely deliver us. But don't believe what your king is saying to you because he is deceiving you. And then... Um, he goes on to say in the Hebrew language to the people, you know, don't listen to your king. Instead, surrender to the Assyrians. If you surrender to the Assyrians, uh, then we will not harm your land. We will allow you to stay in peace. And then later I will come and take you away from your land and I will replace you in different other you know, portions of, the, um, of my empire. So he basically says to the people, I'm giving you a chance to surrender. And this is the argument which he makes in verses 33 and 34. He says, has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Ser Serfaim, Hena and Iva? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can Yahweh deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Is what this man says. So he basically says, he gives a list of all the nations which they have successfully destroyed. And he says, the gods of, all, of those places were not able to defeat uh, me. So what makes you think that you guys will be able to defeat me and that your Yahweh will be able to give you success? So he speaks this out in the Hebrew language that all the people will hear and they will at least go and persuade their king to surrender. But this is, uh, you know, Hezekiah's response. Um, yeah, in fact, um, okay, shortly after that, 2 Kings chapter 19, uh, verses 9 to 13, uh, Sennacherib hears the news uh, that the king of Cush is coming to attack him. So he you know, decides to go back and fight that particular battle with the king of Cush. But again, he sends a, a written letter to Hezekiah saying, I'm going away temporarily because of something which has happened, uh, but I will come back. And in the letter, again, he repeats and he says, say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says Jerusalem will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. And again, he repeats in the letter, that will be 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 12. Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my predecessors deliver them? No. So, you know, basically what he's saying is, you will be defeated. I will come back. I will, you know, defeat you. But Isaiah would have promised Hezekiah in the meantime, saying this guy will not be able to come back. Don't worry. You know, so, um, so Hezekiah goes there to the temple. He spreads out that letter in front of the, of, of the Lord and he says, Lord, you are the one who has to help us. So this is what Hezekiah says. Uh, he says, Lord, uh, this is 2 Kings 19, uh, verse 14 onwards. Hezekiah says, Lord, the God of Israel enthroned between the cherubim. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. And then he says, listen to the words of Senna Sherib, uh, that Senna Sherib has sent to ridicule the living God. And then he says, this uh, lovely verses, you know, 2 Kings 19, verses 17, 18, he says, yeah, it's true that Assyria was able to defeat all the other kings because their gods are made of human hands. Their gods are made of wood. And then, you know, they gold plate the wood with, uh, with, with gold. Those are human-made gods, and that is why they were able to defeat them. And then he says, um, yeah, he says, they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. And so the Lord listens to Hezekiah's prayer. And then uh, the Lord, it says, the angel of the Lord went out among the 
you know enemy camp which was surrounding the city uh, and it says that uh, the angel of the lord destroys 185000 uh, soldiers and it says in uh, second kings 19 verse 36 um when the people got up the next morning there were all the dead bodies and so you know sena sherab has no choice he you know asks the survivors to come back and so he gives up his plans to uh, attack um the southern kingdom but this is actually the you know the the climax of the story we need to look at this verse 37 second kings 19 verse 37 if someone could read out we have just 4 minutes if you could please help as he was worshiping in the temple of his god his god that he sends at the agramelech and star swords struck him down with the sword and they escaped into the land of ararat the ezra for ezra for on his turn right in his place this is the actual climax of the story you know um he went around boasting and saying right that the god of assyria will be able to defeat all the other gods he said can yahweh save you people and now when he is worshiping this god you know whom he admires so much is literally there in the temple of his god nisroch worshiping this idol and while he is doing that nisroch is unable to protect him his own sons come and murder him so you know he dies in that way so it is a bit risky not a bit risky very very risky to take a challenge against the living god and that is what satan is basically trying to do with us believers today you know we find ourselves in helpless situations which we are unable to get out of on our own and uh, we sometimes tend to you know uh, start giving up hope but we must never give up hope because we are under the living god so if we can hold on to this yahweh and say lord you will bring us through through your son jesus christ you will give us the victory which we you know have uh, have a right to because of your covenant with us so if we can hold on to him rather than giving in we will see that the victory will come through because nobody can challenge the living god satan and his evil spirits pretend as though they are gaining an upper hand and we humans may get convinced because you know things look very hopeless when we look through our human eyes but when you look in the spiritual realm all these wicked spirits and satan himself have already been defeated at the cross so if we can hold on to that victory and say lord you won that victory for us for us who are in the new covenant so even though it looks like as if all our fortified cities are being taken over we will not give in we will continue to hold on to you and believe in the victory which you have already won for us on the cross if we can hold on in faith then we will see the downfall of satan in our own family situations i'm not saying it will happen overnight yes for some the lord does grant the victory overnight that's excellent but even if it takes years if we will hold on in faith and know for a fact what jesus did on the cross for us where he spoiled the principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them if we can believe that as the truth and that he did that on our behalf and hold on to that we will see a change in our family situations so like hezekiah we should not give up once his fortified cities began to be captured he panicked and he, he wrote to the king and he said i'll give you money you know you please withdraw he gave in and then of course when the king came to his uh, you know to his gates and to his walls then at that time he went back to the lord and he did see a great victory so let us be people who will hold on to this yahweh because nobody can challenge yahweh i mean imagine this man was worshiping in that temple and that nisroch whom he was worshiping could not protect him from his own sons his own sons murdered him and the man died there defeated you know all his boasts just washed away so that is the power that we have in the living god and we need to keep that in mind um yeah maybe we can just close with a word of prayer
Lord, we thank you for the few stories that we could dwell upon from Second Kings. Lord, we looked at people who expressed faith in you, and we looked at some people who were greedy and chose not to be loyal to you. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will be like Naaman, that we will be like Hezekiah, who placed their faith in you and saw great victories. Lord, an outsider who never even knew Yahweh, was his life was transformed because he trusted in you. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would have the same kind of faith and we will see transformations in our own lives. And we pray that we will be like Hezekiah, who held on to the living God even after his mistake. And Lord, he saw an amazing victory come through. So we pray that we will see that same kind of victory, O oh Lord, in our homes, in our families. Because when you spoiled the principalities and powers, you did it for us on our behalf so that we can walk in victory and be seated with you in the heavenlies in victory, in positions of victory. Enable us, O oh Lord, to walk into and claim these things which are ours in you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.